lecture number 10 um, and um, this lecture is focused on water management issues uh, and uh, so we're calling it flush it down your toilet then drink it uh, so you can surmise that uh, recycling is going to be a big part of, of this lecture uh, as we will see now the system dynamics model that I want to discuss uh, in today's lecture it's uh, referred to as CIWA, a simple water model and this is a collaboration um, among several individuals at several institutions. Uh, the point person uh, for this work is Courtney Gustafson, who is uh, one of my graduate students. And uh, she's also uh, a member of this class. She's taken this class. Um, she wanted to learn a little bit more about sustainability issues and how system dynamics models apply to them. So, um, so but I want to give um, a lot of credit to, to, uh, to her work in this lecture. Now let me tell you what I have in mind for today's lecture. Uh, I think uh, you know we'll give a little bit of an introduction uh, to uh, to CIWA and to water management uh, in general, and uh, I'll talk very briefly about the the CIWA project, and um, we'll go through the CIWA model formulation in Vensim and the model equations, um, and um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about this in my commentary for this lecture. Uh, we'll go through a few case studies uh, for the continental United States for Maricopa County in Arizona in honor of uh, the several number of students that we have um, from Arizona State University enrolled in this class. And uh, we'll talk about also the case study that actually motivated the development of this model, um, uh, which is the case in Somalia, which um, underwent a very severe drought um, a couple of years ago and um, there were some interesting results that we were able to pick up with this model. Uh, finally, I'll do some concluding remarks um, and uh, point out some future directions uh, and expectations for this work. So uh, I think you know a, a big issue with water management is that uh, typically water is when, you know, when we talk about water we talk about it in, in the sense that it's a renewable resource okay and uh, and the truth of the matter is that it's uh, it, even though it's considered uh, an unlimited uh, resource, it's really finite, um, and uh, so in many ways it behaves as a as a limited resource. And uh, the reason for this is because there, there's this um, there's this dichotomy between um, hydrologic cycle processes uh, in, in in hydrology, hydrologic science, in which you know water moves through the hydrologic cycle. Um, um, in in a perennial fashion, so water is always moving, and, and uh, there's always rainfall being created, and, and, and water moving from one place to another. Uh, but on the other hand, um, water as a resource to, for for human use, it's it's a vital resource. So water pretty much touches every aspect of human life, um, and um, and yet water, even though it's sort of unlimited or renewable in in, in the strictest of sense, uh, there's an issue between the availability or the existence of water and the access to water um, by human population. So I'm going to be emphasizing, um, you know, that in the lecture and actually also that philosophy reflects itself in, in the CIWA uh, model. Um, you know, water has direct links to, f to other issues of sustainability, that's food security, Health, sanitation, and you know, and survival, as I just mentioned, um, and and the purpose of, or one of the purposes of, of developing this model is really to to um, to help understand how uh, the freshwater resource uh, uh, can the supply of this freshwater resource, the access to this fr freshwater resource can be modeled. Okay. Um, here's a little cartoon that was, um, and that's there's the source of that uh, this figure, and it's basically used to illustrate that. Uh, you know, of you know, of all the water available on Earth, only you know less than three percent is is fresh. It's of you know, it's of quality that can be used by humans for most of the activities. Of that three percent, you know, most of it, nearly seventy percent, is tied up um, in, um, in 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 frozen form. You know, glaciers, polar uh, caps, um, ice. Uh, about twenty nine percent. It's in groundwater, on, on water in the ground, and then, then roughly 1%, maybe less than 1%, is what's available in, in, in rivers and surface water bodies and lakes. So when you think about the, the big lakes, the Amazon, um, 
uh, the Nile, uh, I mean, in the big lakes, uh, I mean, these comprise such a small fraction of the water available. These comprise, even, you know, when you put them all together, all around the world, less than 1% of a 3% of water available on Earth. So that's, I want to give you a little bit of, of, a, of an idea of, of the scale. Um, and uh, I think the other piece that, that we should mention again is that we're going to be going back to this issue of availability because actually this pie here reflects essentially and, and even this little sliver here this less than one percent this is really the availability of water it, it, it says nothing about access um, to the resource that, that we need okay um, so uh, let's um, let's take uh, a little bit of a step back and tell you a little bit about how um, the seawall model has been conceived okay um, and um, what we have here is uh, it's essentially a water, uh, a, a generalized um, or simplified um, uh, schematic of how water uh, sort of circulates through this management cycle um, and um, how it's tied to two um, major components. One of the major components, it's, it's um, essentially what we call the Earth system, which is the remainder of the Earth, the atmosphere, the oceans, and, 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 uh, and how uh, water, uh, fresh water, okay, interacts with that piece. And the primary interaction, we'll see a little bit more, but the primary interaction comes through uh, precipitation, okay? And, um, um, and, and I should say net precipitation because there's an evaporation flux that goes out of the cycle back to the atmosphere. So that's one What's one major piece, um, and I'll, you know, we'll go back to this because this this is part of the of the big picture of the of the CWA, uh, model philosophy. The other component, of course, is one that we've been dealing with already in the class, uh, and it's population. And then population interacts with the with the water management cycle, uh, essentially by generating demand for water for several activities. You know, anything that has to do from, you know, from cons cons direct consumption to Industry, irrigation, um, and uh, energy generation, and all these issues. Okay, um, and um, so what I want to do focus today, and the CWA model focuses on on the water management, you know, part of the equation. Okay, um, so that's where we're going to be focusing on. So uh, let me move on, let me move on, and let me tell you how uh, this was um, um, implemented in Benson. Okay. And uh, so what I want to do here, I want to show you uh, the, the, you know, the general philosophy and, um, and see how um, this, was, um, this was developed, okay? The, the, um, the CWA model has three uh, primary stocks. Uh, it's got the population stock here on the upper left, okay? And that population stock is driven by births and deaths, uh, like as many as we've seen. This model in particular has got um, an, an immigration rate associated with it, okay? And um, so that allows to consider uh, when population is going into and out of the system. Um, the, um, the other two stocks that come into play are water stocks or water management stocks. One is, um, you know, freshwater sources. Now, freshwater sources are used to account um, for... Uh, amounts of water that are available uh, for use, um, amounts of fresh water that are available for use. So anything that has to do with, with lakes, rivers, uh, groundwater, um, it's, 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 in, it's coupled or it's, uh, it's captured in this stock. Okay? Uh, the next stock that comes into play is the um, freshwater supply or the stored freshwater supply stock. Um, and, um, and that essentially it's the amount of water that is actually accessible because there's infrastructure or there's means to extract it from the source to the process of withdrawal. Okay. Um, now, in the um, there's a separate video to this lecture that that, that covers uh, the logic behind the you know the CWA model um, in general. I just wanted to, to uh, have a glance here of the logic of the model, not necessarily the um, um, the or at this point, not necessarily about all the uh, all the relationships. We we cover those in the in the Venson model. Now, let's take a look at how how this operates. Let, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the on the water management piece, and then uh, I'll I'll tell a little bit more 
about uh, how human in, humans interact with that water management piece. So essentially, the sources of, uh, of fresh water are fed um, by um, a river inflow. So uh, there is, a, in, in, in your system, uh, there is water coming in. Uh, uh, by, uh, and, and river inflow is meant to capture all sorts of inflow, not only rivers, but also groundwater as well, uh, at this point, in this simplified model. Um, and um, uh, so the river inflow and the rainfall, the precipitation uh, rate that, that comes as sources, okay? Um, then um, those sources then are withdrawn through existing infrastructure uh, and become, uh, or a fraction of that becomes uh, fresh water supply. Now once water is in the supply uh, box, uh, a number of things can happen to it. Um, uh, the the um, supply can be uh, collected for consumption, so it can be piped uh, to your house, to your industry, uh, to irrigation uh, fields, um, and uh, so there is um, so there is there, there is a collection of uh, for a water for consumption. Once water is consumed, um, a couple of things that can happen to it. Uh, you know, part of consumed water. Um, it's uh, treated um, as, as wastewater or as, as treated water, residual water. And um, the other fraction is not treated. Um, it goes into runoff, a process called runoff. And, um, and runoff essentially either goes back to the ocean or it goes back to the sources. Okay, so uh, and, that, and a perfect example of this is, um, you, know, water, if you, you know, water is used for irrigation or for irrigation of lawns or irrigation of fields. You know, once it's used, it's it's not really treated anymore. It's basically basically goes away either to the oceans or it percolates into groundwater and actually may may go back to the sources. Um, the fraction of water um, that is treated again, it can it can go into a treatment plant. Part of that um, uh, water uh, can be recycled, okay, and part of that water will not be recycled. The part of the water is not recycled. You know, part of it will run off to the ocean again. Uh, as a final receptor, or go back to the sources. Okay, again through infiltration into groundwater, or through um, you know through uh, flow to uh, to a surface water body like a river or a lake. Okay, now uh, no supply system is perfect, and even though we may want to use as much of the water for consumption as we can, there the system may have leaks. So there's a leakage component here, and, and imagine that. You know, pipes, tanks, reservoirs, they all have leakage um, at, at, to some degree. So a fraction of, of, the, of the supply of fresh water that's available for use ends up as leakage. You know, that leakage actually can, can do a couple of things. Leakage can actually leak back to sources or leakage can actually, uh, you know, go um, into, um, um, you know, it can actually run off and go into the ocean. Okay, so that's a little bit of that, that picture there. Now, so, so by going back to the sources, you sort of close the loop uh, uh, because uh, essentially the sources then get a little bit extra or look, get a little bit of feedback from the remainder of the system through, through these returns of flow to the sources. So every time uh, some water infiltration to the ground becomes groundwater, it's going back to the source. Okay, whatever water doesn't go to the oceans will come back uh, to the sources. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see, so let, let's talk a little bit about the population component. Um, and the population component essentially generates demand, okay? Um, and um, this demand, uh, uh, it's um, it, it essentially once, once the demand side of the equation, as opposed to the supply side of the equation here, once that is established by population, then um, the distribution or the allocation of water becomes a little bit more clear. Because um, the the effective demand is going to drive uh, how much water needs to be collected. Okay, um, as we will see in, in a few minutes, uh, how how much water needs to be collected is going to dictate how, how much water leaks, um, and how much water goes into every single of those every single of these components that go here. Um, and uh, you know, part of the collection will leak. Part of the collection will uh, will go into uh, will be be treated in sewers. Um, and, um, and, and, and part of what's not treated in sewers will go back to the sources. Um, um, and uh, so that's a little bit of the story here. So what I want to do now is want to go 
uh, in addition to this logic, I want to go through the you know the specific uh, relationships between variables that are in the C1 model. So let's, let's take a look at the um, sort of the, uh, the not the logic, but now a little bit more of the formulation, the math mathematical formulation in the C1 model. Um, as I mentioned, there was there was three uh, stock variables: uh, population x, freshwater sources y and freshwater supply z okay let's look at first one the first variable population population is controlled by by a birth rate um, beta a death rate alpha and a rate of immigration that we'll call i and um, what that translates to is an equation that looks like this uh, where uh, we're, we're assuming the the uh, the dot notation for the rate of change of a variable. Um, so x dot is the change of the population over time. Okay, beta x is the rate of births, um, and alpha x is the rate of deaths. Um, I is the rate of immigration. It's net immigration. So you can actually have um, immigration in. Uh, so the population would increase. So if if I is positive, this will cause x to grow. Um, if I is negative, you have net migration out of the system, then this will cause X to decrease. So that's essentially the story. Not that different from what we've seen in, in most cases in which we've dealt with population. Uh, let's look at the freshwater sources in C1. This is the this is the equation that has the most terms because the sources are getting are, are going back and forth with positives and negatives. So the stock of freshwater sources is controlled by the river inflow rate phi right here, okay? So river inflow uh, is, is positive. The river outflow rate C, which is here, it's, it's a negative. It's a you know it's a it's a it's a, it's a minus in the in, in the water balance. The precipitation rate P here it adds to the the sources. The evapotranspiration rate E, which subtracts from the sources. Then there's the rate of water withdrawal from sources into supply W. So this is the withdrawal of water from the sources into the supply of accessible water. Okay. Then there are um, additions, the, re the return flows. There's the, the fraction of, of water that leaks that goes back into the sources. And this is lambda. That's here. There's the fraction of non-recycled water that goes back to the sources, and that's N. And then there's runoff, direct runoff to sources, which is omega. Okay, so this is runoff, this is a leakage return, and this is non-recycled return. Okay, so all these components add up to the change in the sources over time. Okay. Let's look at the supply, which is the, the last uh, of the three stocks. And the freshwater supply is controlled by the supply collection rate, C. Okay. Um, so once it's collected, it basically means that it's fed into, into, the, into the human system and, and, and it, it subtracts from supply. The withdrawal rate, W. So this is the, this is the rate at which water moves from the sources to the supply. So it adds to um, the rate of change of the supply. Then there's recycling, okay? So recycling adds to the supply. And then there's leakage, which subtracts from supply. So those are kind of obvious and straightforward. So this is a little summary of the uh, three stocks or, or state variables, their names, and their governing equations in CWA. Um, uh, this table, by the way, it's found uh, in this table, and, and a lot of the material that I'm about to show you is found in, in the CWA a draft paper that is in the readings folder for this lecture. So let's look at the uh, the key assumptions in CWA um, um, that we have right now. Um, uh, one of the things that we, that we introduced uh, recently was a, a water rooftop collection rate gamma. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the general notion is that a, a fraction of the rainfall will fall on rooftops and people will make use of that. They'll collect it and use it directly. So that's available directly for consumption. 
it doesn't have to be you know withdrawn from the sources so, so this is like a direct connection between rainfall and, and consumption it's like you're you're basically taking water straight from the rain and using it and this is this is certainly the case in many places that are um, water scarce that use directly we thought it would be important particularly for developing uh, countries and developing locations to include this component so th that's there now um, uh, the um, essentially the river inflow the outflow precipitation evaporation the um, the the leakage rate and the in, the immigration are all uh, exogenous variables that's that means they are externally specified uh, and these are essentially links uh, to other models that are out there you know like climate models and demographic models um, and um, so other and other models like that um, withdrawal consumption recycling um, um, actually, I, actually, gamma. It's not. Uh, it's not leakage. L is leakage. Gamma. It's, uh, it's rooftop collection. I, I, I uh, mix that up. Um, so leakage, uh, non-recycling, and the return flows. Um, so this is the the return flows uh, flows of uh, uh, lambda and omega. These are all um, functions of other models and parameters. So they're endogenously calculated. Uh, the model parameters. Uh, are as follows. Uh, there is a demand per capita. And we're going to go through each of these in a minute, but I wanted to call them out. Um, there's a demand per capita. And this is the amount of water um, that it's uh, that is de that's demanded, uh, uh, or for which in each individual creates a demand. There's a technology factor tau uh, that is used to differentiate between um, you know more efficient and less efficient technologies to make use of water. There's a transfer efficiency, uh, which is a measure of, um, of leakage in the system. So more efficiency means less leakage and, 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 uh, and vice versa. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we introduce an assurance factor uh, that is meant, it's meant to capture, uh, this is what I, I call a purely management um, uh, factor. And this is used to capture uh, how reliable um, we think the system is, and I'll explain how it's implemented in, in the uh, in, in the seawall model. There is a maximum withdrawal capacity, and uh, so this is a uh, the a maximum ability of the system to withdraw water from the sources. So there is there is a limitation on how much water can be extracted from the sources at any given time. Uh, there is a maximum recycling capacity again. It's a, it's a variable that's used to reflect the, the maximum ability of the water management system to, re, to recycle water. Um, and there's also a maximum capacity of supply. So this is the maximum amount of water that the supply system can hold. If you think about all the, the reservoirs and the tanks and the pipes, this is the amount of water, the maximum that it can hold at any given time. Okay, So all of these are going to intertwine and interact with each other to generate some interesting dynamics. Um, then there's also three ratios, and these are essentially uh, partitioning coefficients uh, or partitioning fractions that indicate, uh, you know, for example, um, you know, what what part of the of the water that's consumed actually goes into the sewer. Okay, we already mentioned that part of the water that's consumed goes to the sewer; part of it just goes directly to runoff. Okay, uh, then there's a second ratio, the runoff to sources. So this is the fraction of water that goes into runoff that makes it back into the sources because the rest goes goes into the ocean. And then there's the non-recycle to sources ratio. So this is the amount of water that's not recycled, so the, the sorry, the fraction of water that's not recycled that goes back to the sources because the other fraction will go to the oceans. Okay, so this is a so these are sort of partitioning ratios um, that, that are very useful to to test uh, you know some potential scenarios. And uh, the last key assumption is that the it's assumed that the leaked water returns to the sources with a time delay lambda. And the general notion here is that if you imagine, you know, uh, that there's a leak, the, there's a leakage in a pipe or in a tank or in a reservoir, and that water starts infiltrating or or starts flowing towards a river. There is a time that it's going to take for that water to get back to the source. Okay. And that delay is uh, essentially uh, this time lambda, and we'll we'll see how that again is implemented in, in, in the simulation model. 
So let's talk about um, water demand um, and, uh, and try to see how all these um, equations come together. So the total demand of water, um, capital delta, it's a little delta, which is the demand per capita. This is demand of water per, per person times the number of people, times the population. Okay. Um, now, um, because uh, different locations around the world uh, may have the same demand per capita, but have different capabilities of, um, of, um, of using water, because they have better technologies or they have worse technologies depending on the situation, uh, we introduced a technology factor tau and uh, by dividing uh, the demand by the technology factor we obtained um, uh, something we're calling the effective demand. Okay. Now the effective demand is uh, as a reflection not only of the demand per, you know, demand per capita or the total demand but also um, the technology factor. Uh, so that's how it's calculated. The effective demand is a demand per capita times the population divided by this technology factor. Now, uh, a technology factor equals one, or tau equals one, represents essentially sort of a baseline technology. Um, if tau is greater than one, so if, if then this indicates that you have a water saving technology because basically for the same number of people and the same demand per capita, you would actually have an, a less effective demand if, if this number is greater than one. On the other side, if tau is less than one, if you have a, you essentially have a um, a water, uh, a, you know, here's called dispensing. It's essentially a a water wasting <laughs> type of technology. And then uh, for the same, you know, same number of people and same demand per capita. So same the demand ca per capita can be interpreted as sort of a living standard. This is the amount of water that each person needs per day, and this is of course different in different locations, but for this, under the same conditions, then a tau less than one will result in more on more demand or more water being used for the same amount of people and the same demand per capita. Okay? So it's that, it's, that, will, that, will, that will lead to an inefficient water dispensing technology. So that's essentially the picture with demand. Let's look at uh, you know, water consumption and, uh, and, the, and the transport efficiency. Now, if you think about uh, uh, the amount of water that is actually consumed. So you you know if you if you think about the um, the fraction of the water that um, that population consume as a fraction of the water that it's of, that it's available or it's, that it's accessible um, for consumption, then you realize that um, because there there's leakage uh, that um, that there is going to be an efficiency of transfer between what actually gets consumed, which is C, and what would actually be available for consumption, which is C plus L. Okay, so C plus L will be like the total amount of water that could be consumed, but of that C plus L, only C gets consumed because L gets leaked. So this immediately defines in a transfer efficiency eta. Okay, um, and the only only that fraction eta is what gets consumed. Okay. Um, the, the nice thing about this simple formulation is that you can actually then link leakage to consumption uh, by using the efficiency. So if you, if, you, if you know the efficiency or if you have an estimate of the efficiency of transfer, then you can immediately uh, get an estimate of how much water is being leaked, okay? And vice versa. You know, if you, get, if you know how much water is being leaked, you can get the efficiency. So it works both ways. Now let's talk about the supply components, and we, we saw that supply is driven by withdrawal, by consumption, by leakage, and by recycling. So let's take a look at those four components uh, one by one. Now, um, and this is, uh, it, if, you, if you follow the logic, you'll understand what's going on here, um, and I'll try to explain this as carefully as possible. Let's, uh, let's look at the... Uh, water withdrawal. Remember this is the water that's withdrawn from the sources and converted into supply. Okay, and uh, so what we're going to postulate here, uh, the way we formulate this, is that the water withdrawn um, is going to be the minimum of, of, of one of three things. The minimum of these three things. The first one, it's the 
it's the um, source amount y so this is the availability of water in the source divided by the time interval and by the way this model runs on, on monthly time steps so we're looking at, at monthly uh, monthly water balances so this here y divided by delta t it's essentially the amount of water in the sources on any given month we multiply that by theta remember the assurance factor and the general idea of doing that the assurance factor is a factor that is less than one so it's a fraction the general idea is that we we use that as sort of a protection to say well you know we we don't know exactly how much water there is in the source at any given time so we're going to assume that we're that we even if we have a good estimate of it we're going to only withdraw at, at a, um, a, a fraction of that. So that's why we multiply by this assurance factor. Um, so that's one that's w one of the factors that goes into withdrawal. Then another way to look at, at the withdrawal rate is to look at from the supply side. Okay, And uh, if you look at the supply side if at, at any point in time or for any given month you calculate the maximum capacity of supply minus what is there already, this difference will give you the supply space available to take in more water from the sources and so this here is and again divided by delta t so you do it on a monthly basis and again multiply it by this assurance factor to be consistent with the comparison with the sources okay and then of course you have the maximum withdrawal rate which is the maximum capacity of the system and if you imagine that you're extracting water from the sources from pipes and from pumps and from wells uh, I mean these uh, this infrastructure has got has got a, a capacity a maximum capacity that, that cannot be exceeded uh, so you have to throw that into the picture so if you compare any of these three you take the least of them and and any given month that is the amount of water you can withdraw okay so that's the that's the logic behind withdrawal okay let's look now at consumption Okay, now consumption is going to be, um, and this takes a little bit of, of, of thought to understand. Um, it's, um, so let me, let me walk you through this. It's going to be the maximum of two values. Okay, now um, the, um, if you think about consumption, consumption is essentially, it's, it's driven, um, you know, it's, it's driven by, um, by demand. So you can, for example, at, at any point in time, um, if you have the water available, okay, um, you know, you can just consume whatever you want. So that's basically this effective demand. So uh, if, you, if you have plenty of water available, you can consume um, at will. However, if there is a limitation, okay, so if, if um, the supply available in a given month, so that's this ratio between Z of T and delta T, this is the amount of water in any given month that is available in the supply, multiply by the efficiency because we know there's going to be some leakage and multiply by the assurance factor okay uh, again to to cover uh, our backs in, in in terms of the uh, reliability or this the uncertainty of these parameters if if this number is less in the demand then you have to go with the lower because that's this is the water you have available so you take the least of these two okay and you subtract the rooftop collection. Why? Because rooftop collection is being used, so that covers some some of the of the consumption need. Um, so if you if you if you do that and that number is you know is positive, you know then then um, you consume that. However, if that number is negative, if you have a um, you know if, if any of these numbers don't work out, then you there is a scenario in which you can't consume any water. So this, this zero is here to make sure that if you run into a situation where you have no water in the system that you can't use, then you just have to, I mean, this is basically rationing. There's no water uh, that's, that's used that month, okay? It's a little bit strict, but it's, it's useful to have there just in case. So that's the logic behind the consumption of water, okay? Uh, the leakage component of supply we've already seen and it's linked to the consumption so once the consumption is defined by the previous equation then the leakage is just simply calculated with the efficiency so that's uh, a little bit more straightforward 
And then there's the recycling, okay? Recycling follows a logic similar to the withdrawal, okay? The amount of water on any given month that can be recycled is the least of these three components, okay? Let's see. The first one is, again, it's the amount of water that is uh, that's that's available in the system. So if you if you look at the difference between the maximum supply and the actual supply, this tells you how much space you have uh, for water on any given month, and you multiply by that by the um, by the assurance factor. So that's one factor you compare to. Then there's this factor sigma. Okay, and sigma is defined here as the amount of water. Um, from the consumption and the leak and, and the rooftop so this is the you know the the total amount that's being consumed uh, times Sigma and Sigma converts this volume of water into um, into the amount of water that actually goes into the sewer the amount of the only that fraction of water that goes into the sewer can be recycled so that goes here and then the third component in that comparison is the maximum um, rate of recycling. Again, these, these pipes and, these, uh, and this infrastructure that's, that's able to recycle water, it's got a capacity. So whichever of these three is smaller, that's the amount on that given month that you can recycle. Okay? Um, so that's the logic uh, behind the, the recycling factors. Now let's look at water that returns to the sources, and we, and we know that there's three amounts of water that return to sources. Um, um, one is the um, is the is the is, is the runoff return uh, omega, okay? And this is um, let's take a look at this logic. We know that C plus gamma is the total amount of water that was consumed, okay? Um, Sigma times C plus gamma is the amount of water that actually goes into the sewer. And 1 minus sigma times C plus gamma is the amount of water that's consumed that does not go into the sewer. Okay, And uh, omega is the fraction of that that is taken from, again, consumed water, not in sewers. A fraction of that goes into the sources. And that's how the logic for omega is constructed. Um, then there is the leakage return to the sources, which we saw in the key assumptions that that leakage return to the sources is the leaked water delayed by a time factor lambda. So what this is saying is that whatever leaks gets to the sources lambda times later, or that lambda could be a month, it could be half a month, it could be two months, depending on the system. The non-recycled water that returns to the, into the sources is found by multiplying. Remember this sigma? This sigma that we saw before? This was the amount of water that was consumed, okay? Um, and um, that was um, put into the sewer, okay? Now, if you, if you subtract the recycling from sigma, then you get the non-recycled water. And if you multiply that by nu, which is the ratio, which is essentially the proportion of non-recycled water that makes it back into the sources, then you can calculate. That's the logic to calculate n. Okay, so that's how these return to sources are calculated. So here, this table summarizes essentially what we just saw. It it, it actually has. All the um, the you know the variables the model variables here in the first column and and uh, their their denominations and how they're calculated and you can see that you know as we said before a number of them are externally specified which means that you have to do uh, you know some uh, some some research to try to understand how how much rainfall your site gets or how much river inflow your site gets and etc and then the others are calculated using you know using that logic. Okay, that we just saw. So this is just a summary of that, and here is a summary of the parameters. Okay, that appear uh, with their names and their and their symbols. Okay, this is just a a little bit of a nomenclature of the C1 model because when you have a lot of parameters and a lot of these functions, it's good to keep track and, and summarize these. And all of these again, 
are found in the CIWA paper that was um, that was distributed in the readings folder for this lecture. Let's take a look at some results and, and um, as I mentioned before we have uh, we have three case studies the contiguous United States, uh, Maricopa County in Arizona and Somalia. Let me walk you through some key results and in the lecture folder um, you have the CIWA models for each of these cases for the US for Maricopa County and for Somalia that you can look at in detail. Um, so if you implement this model in the contiguous United States uh, and, uh, and, it's, and it's really um, you know the general idea here is that it's, it's kind of difficult to capture the entire country uh, with a single with a single model like this because it, this this really doesn't differentiate uh, areas that are, that, are, that are you know water rich or more prone to having water like you know say uh, Louisiana or Florida um, you know the, 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 the east the east coast of the United States or, or the Pacific Northwest which are relatively water rich and then and then you have these arid zones and in the you know in the southwest um, 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 and in mid latitudes of the country where um, you really you, so you cannot you cannot capture the same dynamics because it's really not the same picture you know managing water in California is very different than managing water in Florida and 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 those two are very different than managing water in Texas or in the Northeast so um, so that's a, it's essentially an issue but um, Again, uh, I'm showing results here for population, and uh, given um, current demographic projections, uh, um, and th these are over the next, uh, you know, 100 months, which is, it's what, like eight years or so, uh, the population is going to continue to increase. But the more interesting comparison comes um, when you look at supply and sources, because this this difference will tell you um, how well you're doing in terms of uh, how much water you have in your sources versus how much water you need to have in supply to satisfy demand. Um, so the, the, the blue curve here is the sources and the red is the demand. And here what's sort of indicated is the you know the US as a whole has um, you know has enough water uh, to go around for you know for uh, you know years to come. So that's the that's just that's a general message. But again with that big caveat that this considers the country as a whole, it doesn't differentiate and there, there are regions in, in, in the country that probably won't follow this pattern, which is the reason why we looked at the at the Arizona, um, Maricopa County, Arizona, where we, you know, there was plenty of data to to um, to work with a model like this, and um, the results here uh, show that indeed um, there was a situation. Uh, so th this is the population of the curve, and you know, population appears to be growing more or less quickly or more or less exponentially um, and that now we're looking at a much larger time scale um, so we're looking at uh, you know this would be here a um, hundred years uh, so this is 150 years and so on uh, so we're looking at a very long-term simulation and if you look at the sources versus supply here see you you have you have a, um, a picture that's so inverted from when we did the model for the entire United States, where essentially your you know your your supply is already exceeding your um, the availability of your sources, and because of population growth and increasing demand, because of population growth, um, and uh, maybe you know better technologies not being able to catch up, then you have a situation in which your sources are going to be drawn down, um, and then this is going to generate um, you know a a decrease in the avail in, in the availability of the supply to to keep up. And of course, when you reach a point where you run out, out of, you know, essentially run out of sources, then you start getting, uh, you know, this uh, this very unstable oscillation uh, where you really can't. First of all, you're going to be much, much below uh, on your availability of supply to uh, to meet demand. But it's also uh, the system is going to be very unstable. You're going to be you're going to have these oscillations. Um, think about these oscillations in the same. Sort of in the same in the same light that we looked at uh, in the tragedy of the commons uh, example, where we saw these oscillations, where in in a, in a way that we you know that it, that's really the system was not able to be sustainable over time. Now let's go to the case in Somalia, which is the case that motivated uh, the um, 
you know, this development of this model in the first place. Um, and um, Somalia had an interesting situation is that in, in, um, in, in, in year 2011, there were, um, in Somalia, it's got, it's got a climate, it's, it's kind of interesting because it has sort of two, within a year, it's got two rainy seasons. And uh, what happened in 2011 in Somalia is that in both of these rainy seasons during 2011, the country received essentially zero water. So it's completely dry. Uh, to the point where the United Nations declare a famine uh, in Somalia, and and, and um, we're able, we were actually able. Um, this is part of the um, part of, of how we're developing uh, this draft paper that we're working on is to to see how you know a model like this um, you know can be used to uh, predict or project the set of conditions that would lead to famine in the future. Okay. Um, and uh, so this is again the, the population plot. But let's look at the again the at, at this one here. This is the the sources versus the supply. And again, you have a situation in which already uh, from the from from the onset uh, the supply is exceeding the, the the availability of the source. So you're running into you're running into an unstable situation. Um, in this case, uh, over 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 time, you know the the supply. I'm sorry. The the, the sources are able to recover quicker than the supply is grows because of demand and 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 eventually they're able you know the, the sources are able to sort of catch up with supply over time um, um, however uh, you know um, and we looked at uh, this case in a little bit more depth depth than, than the others um, we start looking at well what happens if you know for example if uh, if climate changes and you start getting for instance, less rainfall, like it happened in 2011, and um, and uh, what happens is that the um, when when rainfall is equal to potential evapotranspiration, meaning that essentially you have sort of a uh, net zero, um, you know, water from climate, uh, um, then um, you know your your sources and your supply tend to uh, tend to run together over time. There's a little bit of a divergence after you know, a number of years, but and, and but the divergence is not too big. But when you start getting lower rainfall, I believe in this simula in this in this model, uh, the the potential of transpiration is, is 15 uh, cubic kilometers per month. Um, that's about that's about the value. Um, so if you have less, um, if you have less rainfall, you can start seeing that the, you know, that it has a, a pretty big effect, and you know, immediately uh, supply is going to outrun the sources. Uh, over time, you know the sources sort of catch up, um, um, but there's a there's a period of, of danger here. If uh, if if it starts even to run uh, even slower rainfall, this difference extends uh, a little bit more. Although there's not a there's not a huge difference, you can see that it really displaces a little bit to the right, but not much. Then if if, if it rains more, uh, then um, you know this uh, you know this deficit sort of shifts to the left a little bit and. And um, you know you uh, you're, you're able to the, the sources are able to catch up a little bit quicker, um, but you can see that this is a, a this is a uh, a country or, or or a water management system that is that is very vulnerable. You know one of the things that we also saw in Somalia is to to look at uh, the effect of other variables besides climate, and you know one of the, the uh, factors that we looked at was this uh, the influence of of this technology factor, what happens if you you know if you have if you can introduce better technology into a system, and uh, we ask the question, well, what would be the time to deplete the sources of water under under given you know under given conditions of use, um, and uh, and remember that the technology factor. Uh, oh, I'm missing an H here. Oops, sorry. Um, the technology factor. Uh, uh, greater than one means better technology. Okay, so if you have better technology, what you see immediately here is that um, you're able to prolong uh, this depletion time. This is again depletion time is the time that you run out of water sources. You're you're able to to, to extend that um, uh, you know further out into the future. You know you know um, you know 100 years in this case for the supply and 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 for the sources. You know also you know uh, almost a, you know 100 years out. To the future, of course, if you if you use you know less efficient technologies, then situation uh, you know it's you get you know you you your sources run out in half the time 
um, that it takes with, with better technology. So that's, that was one question we asked. And then we, we looked at um, what happens if you, can, um, if you can decrease leakage by increasing efficiency. Um, so if you increase efficiency, again, the, the, the more you increase efficiency, uh, the, better, uh, the better off you are in terms of, of that depletion time. Okay, so that's sort of the idea with that. So these these are kind of things that you can you can and, and, and the nice thing about doing it with models like this is that you can actually run these simulations over over extended periods of time and sort of uh, have you know generate some thinking into the future that you might not be able to do otherwise. Okay, and I'm going to point this out a little bit in my commentary for this lecture. So in terms of applications, you know, of, of a model like this, uh, you know, water budgeting projections and doing scenario analysis like the ones that I just showed you, uh, you can quantify the effects of, of improving infrastructure. Imagine that if you're, you know, you can reduce leaks or increase recycling or build uh, more supply by building more reservoirs and better operational reservoirs. That's the kind of thing that you can do with a model like this, planning for that. You also quantify the effects of, of of softer, you know, policy interventions, like, you know, for example, what happens if you rationalize demand? Um, you know, what happens if you decrease demand um, by, um, you know, have, uh, having a more efficient use of water? Introducing economic incentives, we haven't done this here yet, but certainly uh, if we start looking at, um, you know, c considerations uh, in economics like we saw in the last lecture, you know, like present value, and future value, and benefit cost analysis, certainly we're going to be able to identify scenarios that are better, better economically as well. So, uh, and analyze uh, whatever scenarios we have now on the table from an economic standpoint. So that's something we're looking forward to doing. Um, I already mentioned the, the looking at effects um, from, um, from changes in climate um, through rainfall and temperature, which affect, um, you know, evapotranspiration and, and the water balance. Um, um, other things that we have that are not here yet is, um, you know, linkages to, to human health effects, um, you know, sanitation issues, uh, impacts to ecosystems. So we would need to add, um, you know, linked modules to this. And that's, so that's part of the exercise that continues with this. Um, and this leads me to two conclusions. Uh, so a model like CEWA can be used to, 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 um, um, to, to analyze regions and locations, it needs to be refined and fine-tuned for that purpose and, and uh, can be used to support assessments and decision-making, um, primarily with enough lead time to help avoid you know, risks of either having too much water or, or deficient water supplies. Um, so CEO is really a tool for um, avoidance of mismanagement of water and uh, it's, it's because it's, it's really uh, it's really tailored to analyze uh, both the hard side, the infrastructure side, but also uh, the policy interventions. Um, lessons learned through these very preliminary exercises is that, um, you know, there's a need for reliable and accurate data. Um, and uh, I'll also talk a little bit about this in my commentary, but you can certainly complement your understanding of water management by doing modeling exercises like this and and understand better your uncertainty and your sensitivity um, uh, in, of the results uh, to, through these simulations. Now it's always useful to remember that models are different than reality and you really, models should be viewed more to look at likely scenario outcomes and, and try to use that to support decision making. Um, so, um, and, and, uh, so the reliability of this model is going to depend on the reliability of the data that we have and in the real reliability of the assumptions that we make and, and only through an, a highly iterative process in which we try something, we run it, we, you know, we, we look at the results, we, we see if it makes sense, if, it's, if it gives you, us an, an additional insight. So these are more like thinking tools uh, and tools to aid our, our understanding of, of, the, of, the, of these complex. You can see that even with, within this simple water management model, um, this is really, these systems are really, really complex. Um, and, uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I, I, um, I hope um, that, um, you know, you enjoy this and um, that you can use this for, for other purposes. Well, things that we're thinking about doing is to uh, couple 
a model like CEWA or CEWA to a regional climate model um, to have a better handle on the climate components, particularly precipitation and evaporation, and as well as the river inflow and outflows. These right now are being externally specified to CEWA, so we need a couple we need to couple this into a climate model so we have a better handle on these. Right now we're sort of just saying, well, we're going to use this for rainfall, this for evaporation, but there's really no dynamic there. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, the, the, the other frontier is the economic coupling. Um, and, um, and I think this will be very useful to look at uh, how these different variables are actually monetized um, and uh, to be able to run cost-benefit analysis and, and, um, and do, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, do policy choice support um, based on economics and coupled economics. Um, so that was pretty much it. I think I, I'm going to leave it at that. You can watch the C1 model in, in this link and I encourage you to do that because we go there into a little bit more, a little bit more detail uh, of, of the model. And I also want to ask you to please remember to go over the readings for this lecture. Um, I put in the readings folder uh, two, uh, you know, in addition to CY, I put two system dynamics models, one that was done for Nevada, um, which is an arid zone, and what was that was done for South Florida, which is, which is a wet zone or a wet area. And just so you can look at the contrast and the concerns and the issues and how those were approached. It's a very interesting reading, and I encourage you to do it. So um, I think I'll leave it at that, so watch out for... Uh, again, the CWO model video and Vensim, also uh, the readings, and also my commentary that will be up shortly. I hope you en enjoy uh, the rest of the week. Take care now.